Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Leon Krempel. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Alfredo Jahr. For those of you who are not familiar with his work, which has been shown extensively around the world, let me say that our exhibition, Image Contact Image, offers the opportunity to, for a close encounter. We are showing two pieces by Alfredo Jahr, both stemming from a group of works that refer to the genocide in Rwanda. A first untitled Newsweek from 1994, and second the installation Real Pictures from 1995. I've been uh, showing an adapted version, especially made for House de Cons. Born in Santiago de Chile, Alfredo Jahr lives and works in New York. He describes himself as an artist, architect, and filmmaker. I have seen him also as an important thinker. In the context of this exhibition, he is shifting the attention to the withdrawal of images, be it intentionally by the mass media or consciously by the artist. It is easy to hang a picture on the wall or to upload into the internet. But when it comes to describe the content of an image, things become difficult. Alfredo Jahr presents all of, all of his lectures under the reading, it is difficult. It is indeed difficult. Alfredo, thank you very much for coming to Munich. Thank you. exhibition and this symposium. I'm also honored to share the stage with so many distinguished uh, intellectuals. I have prepared a, a lecture before coming to Munich, but uh, I would like to respond to what we heard this morning from the two first speakers, so I made some slight changes. Uh, I became an artist because I do not understand the world. As simple as that. It sounds naive, like Trevor said just earlier. But I became an artist because I would like to understand the world, and I do not understand it. And so my work is the construction of models to understand the world. That's what I try to do as an artist. And uh, this morning, uh, I was impressed by the uh, certainty uh, displayed by the two first speakers about this situation we image. Admirable certainty. On the contrary, I'm uncertain. I'm full of doubts. Uh, as an artist, I've never been afraid to say, I don't know. And in case of this image, I can say, I don't know. So I'd like to explain why. This is a piece I created last year called May 1st, 2011. And it's, it's very simple. It confirms two monitors, slightly in an angle, and then two prints on their sides. The monitor on the left shows the situation room image by Pete Sosa, and then, which is here, and then the small print 
is just a diagram that explains who is in this picture. It's a text that was uh, presented by the, the White House. And so these are the credit lines from the official White House photograph. On the other side, I have an empty screen and an empty print. This is a case where we are being asked to believe without seeing. And when we look at this extraordinary image, I felt manipulated. It is just too perfect. And when Mrs. Clinton said that she was sneezing, <laughs> then I started researching on this image. <laughs> this image was offered for free on, on the White House Flickr website. And then if you download it and you request the properties through Photoshop, it will tell you that this image was created on uh, May 1st, 2011, at 4.05 p.m. This is information that you cannot change. Many organizations requested more images from this session, and after a day or two, they release this set of nine pictures from the same moment. This image, if we analyze it, was taken the same day at around 23.42, which is roughly at the time President Obama announced the death of Bin Laden. This was taken at the same time of the lecture of this presentation. And this one, shortly after, he was probably being congratulated by his staff. This was taken just a few minutes before <coughs> going out to announce it. 30 minutes before, probably calling some head of state to announce what this was going to say. And this one is taken two hours before, which all makes sense. But this image that we also saw this morning was taken at 8 p.m., which means four hours after the Situation Room image that was released to the world. And this was officially the ending of that session. And then we discovered that image, that announcement was made 28 hours after the killing. So, in the face of that evidence, I can say, I don't know. And I just wanted with this work to share my incertitude with the audience. This was taken at 2.25 p.m., two hours before that photo. In the, in the effect that this image provoked around the world, a few things were left out. The, the loss of lives on both camps. And this is the, the marvelous way of hiding it from the rest of the world. And uh, we have two of these, two screens, one yellow and one red.
So in the, in the face of these uh, informations that we discovered doing a little research, I created this work to, to share with the audience this, this unease with this image and uh, to simply say, I just don't know. This is just to add a little uh, information to the, this morning session and to explain what I did when I did that piece. I'd like to start now what I had prepared for you. Uh, the, the two pieces on view here focus on the Rwanda project, a project that I dedicated to the genocide in Rwanda for six years. As you know, uh, a genocide took place in 100 days and it left a, hundred, I mean, a million people in the face of the criminal indifference of the rest of the world. And uh, I'm showing two works here. And these works, I see them as exercise of representation, futile exercise of representation. Exercise philosophical essays of representation. I would like to start with this moment, four years after the genocide, when President Clinton decided to visit Rwanda. But to say visit is an exaggeration. He stayed at the airport. And among other things, this is what he had to say. It may seem strange to you here, especially to many of you who lost members of your family but all over the world, there were people like me sitting in offices day after day after day who did not fully appreciate the depth and the speed with which you were being engulfed by this unimaginable terror. April 6, 1994, a plane carrying the presidents of Rwanda and Burundi is shot down above Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. Their death sparked widespread massacres targeting Hutu moderates and the minority Tutsi population in Kigali and throughout Rwanda. The Rwandan Patriotic Front, which had been encamped along the northern border of Rwanda, starts a new offensive. April 12, 1994. The interim Rwandan government flees Kigali for the town of Hitarama. Relief officials estimate that as many as 25,000 people have been killed in Kigali alone in the first five days of violence. April 21, 1994. The United Nations Security Council Resolution 912 reduces the UN peacekeeping force in Rwanda from 2,500 to 270. 50,000 deaths. April 30, 1994. At least 1.3 million Rwandans have fled their homes. More than 250,000 refugees crossed the border into Tanzania, the largest mass exodus ever witnessed by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. 100,000 deaths. May 8, 1994. The Rwandan Patriotic Front gains control of most of northern Rwanda. As killings continue, hundreds of thousands of refugees flee to Zaire, Burundi, and Uganda. 200,000 deaths. May 13, 1994. More than 30,000 bodies wash down the Kagera River, which marks Rwanda's border with Tanzania. May 17, 1994. The United Nations Security Council passes Resolution 918, authorizing the deployment of 5,500 UN troops to Rwanda. The resolution says acts of genocide may have been committed. May 22, 1994, the Rwandan Patriotic Front gains full control of Kigali and the airport. 300,000 deaths. May 26, 1994, Deployment of the mainly African UN force is delayed due to a dispute over who will provide equipment and cover the cost for the operation. 400,000 deaths. 
June 5, 1994. The United States argues with the UN over the cost of providing heavy armored vehicles for the peacekeeping force. 500,000 deaths. June 10, 1994. The killings of Tutsis and moderate Hutus continues even in refugee camps. 600,000 deaths. June 17, 1994. France announces its plan to send 2,500 troops to Rwanda as an interim peacekeeping force until the UN troops arrive. 700,000 deaths. June 22, 1994. With still no sign of UN deployment, the United Nations Security Council authorizes the deployment of 2,500 French troops to southwest Rwanda. 800,000 deaths. June 28, 1994, the UN Rights Commission's Special Envoy releases a report stating that the massacres were pre-planned and formed part of a systematic campaign of genocide. July 4, 1994, French troops established a so-called safe zone in the southwest of Rwanda. July 8, 1994, as the Rwandan Patriotic Front advances westward the influx of displaced persons into the so-called safe zone increases from 500,000 to 1 million within a few days. 900,000 deaths. July 12, 1994. An estimated 1.5 million Rwandans flee towards Zaire. More than 15,000 refugees cross the border every hour and enter the town of Goma, which becomes the largest refugee camp in the world. A cholera epidemic sweeps through the camps in and around Goma, killing an estimated 50,000 people more. July 21, 1994, the United Nations Security Council reaches a final agreement to send an international force to Rwanda. One million people have been killed. Two million have fled the country. Another two million are displaced within Rwanda. August 1st, 1994, Newsweek magazine dedicates its first cover to Rwanda. I followed the events through the press, of course, starting in, in April. And I decided to go to Rwanda when I stumbled upon this little article on page 5 of the New York Times. Page 5, in May. In May there were already 800,000 deaths. I'd like you to read the one that is highlighted in yellow. In the meantime, thousands of bodies are washing down the Gagera River, which marks the border with Tanzania. The Lutheran World Federation in Geneva said it had begun clearing the bodies out of the river near where it empties into Lake Victoria in Uganda. It said the operation was requested by Uganda and financed by $100,000 provided by the United States. It said the operation did not include collection of an estimated 25,000 bodies that already had washed into the lake. It said the operation did not include collection of an estimated 25,000 bodies that already had washed into the lake. A5. I'm going to review very quickly the press. And what's important to consider is when it came out. This is the New York Times magazine already in June. So when the killings had ended and it's about the surreal horrors of the Rwandan refugees. Because we didn't want to talk about the killings, about the genocide. We prefer to talk about the refugees. That was the subject. The Economist, in June 25, July 1st, 
who will save Rwanda? Again, a million dead, two million displaced within Rwanda, two million refugees outside of Rwanda, and we ask the question, who will save Rwanda? And inside, Rwanda can wait. We can also joke about it. We can offer a little African skeleton three choices for death. Machete, Kalashnikov, or cholera. Wonder, fear or cholera. So let's displace the meaning. This is our famous This Week magazine from August 1st. And inside the race with death. The rest has ended. And then we ask, can they be saved? No, they can't. It's too late. And then we offer them ways of helping out in August 1994. As you know, time and Newsweek spy on each other and then they, they follow closely what the one will come up as the main article. So when Newsweek decide to put Rwanda, then time decide to do the same. This is a time issue from August 1st, 1994. And then the Figaro asked the question that they call taboo. <coughs> Should we recolonize Africa? And of course, it's the drama of independence. How do we explain this? We may have a few explanations, but the one I'd like to put forward is the issue of racism. This is a work from 1996 called Searching for Africa in Life. Here we have 2,500 covers of Life magazine, the magazine that invented photojournalism, that sent journalists around the world to show us the world. Whole generations of American and citizens of the world grew up reading this extraordinary magazine. So, the first cover from here is from 1936, when the magazine started and, and when it ended in 1996. They're all here. So the title of this work says it all, Searching for Africa in Life. If you do search for Africa in Life magazine, you will find perhaps five or six covers. And of course, they're mostly about animals. Another work from the same series. These are the nine most recent covers of Time magazine. The title of the work is From Time to Time. And this is what they focus on animals, hunger, and disease. There's nothing else. And just the last one, a recent cover of Business Week asking if greed can save Africa.
It may seem strange to you here, especially to many of you who lost members of your family. But all over the world, there were people like me sitting in offices day after day after day who did not fully appreciate the depth and the speed with which you were being engulfed by this unimaginable terror. The first project I did was in Rwanda. I, I found a post office that had been bombed and I found a box of postcards on this floor. So I decided to start sending these postcards to friends to announce that I was okay. So I would write down names of people I met in my travel around Rwanda and just say, Jean de Dieu Rungalimana is still alive. Or Joseline Mukadidanga is still alive. I wanted to send signs of life about Rwanda and, and indirectly about myself to those friends that were worried. Justine Mukadidanga is still alive. Of course, this work makes reference to a, a monument of conceptual art on Kawara, which I like very much. I actually collect these postcards. And, uh, but here I wanted to take out this uh, self-referential uh, aspect and, and, and put it on someone else. Rubanda Tresifoli is still alive. Caritas Namazu is still alive. Carita is an 85-year-old woman, and she walked more 300 kilometers from her home in Rwanda and arrived at Goma, a refugee camp that had a million people, and that's where I found her and photographed A few months later, I was invited by the city of Malmö in Sweden to occupy 50 light boxes around the city. And uh, I was not ready to share images of what I had seen. I had taken more than 3,000 pictures. And so basically I designed an anti-ad, which is just the word Rwanda spelled out as many times as I could in, in, a, in a bold font. It was a kind of cry, Rwanda, Rwanda, Rwanda. No phone numbers, no names, nothing. Because these locations had been donated to this non-profit organization to do this project, they gave us bad locations. So this one, for example, was isolated there in a, in a very small area. But I like that. I like the silence around these, these cries for help. My first installation in a museum is called Real Pictures. And here I, I tried a different strategy because the project, the Rwanda project, is a series of different strategies where they all failed and I tried different ones. So here I thought, well, we were shown these images but no one reacted, so perhaps you really didn't see them. So now that I am hiding them, perhaps you will see them better. So I created these me memorials in the memory of the people of Rwanda. So these contains 550 photographs, but they are inside black boxes that contain a seal screen description of the image inside. But you cannot open it and you cannot see it. I'm just inviting you to read the description of these images. So I wanted to create a space of silence, of desolation, and invite people to consider these images without actually seeing them, or perhaps the text would help them to see them better. It was very important for me that each box contained a print, and they did, even though they could not be opened and no one could touch them, but they were there.
These photographs show Benjamin Musisi, 50, crouched low in the doorway of the church among scattered bodies spilling out into the daylight. 400 Tutsi men, women, and children who had come here seeking refuge were slaughtered during Sunday Mass. Benjamin looks directly into the camera as if recording what the camera saw. He asked to be photographed among the dead. He wanted to prove to his friends in Kampala, Uganda, that the atrocities were real and that he had seen the aftermath. Next to each presentation of real pictures, we, we always made sure to show what the press had done about the genocide and what the NGOs were doing at the time. And we also offered a space for reflection. We offered, in this case, index cards for comments. Another exercise, this one is called Field, Road and Cloud. Three large banal photographs on the wall with three very large black labels. When you approach the first image, you see an empty field. It doesn't communicate much. If you're an expert, you will know that these are tree fields, tea fields. But then the text, the little label next to it, tells you that it is a tea field and it was shot number 15. 40 kilometers from Kigali and in the direction to the Natarama Church on May 29, 1994. Next to the second image, the sketch tells us shot number 21, road to Natarama Church. <coughs> so then we understand. So these are sketches that the photographer does to, to remember what he shot on the same date. The last image a single cloud in the sky, a few trees, and then the sketch that says, shot number 29, lonely cloud. And at the bottom left, it says, bodies, 500. Only at that moment, the, the spectator understand that the photographer is photographing this cloud and is surrounded by perhaps 500 bodies. I did this piece when I discovered many images of flowers, trees, skies in my rolls of film when I came back. I thought the lab had made a mistake and I called the lab I said, hey, you gave me stuff that's not mine. He said, no, they are in between. Just look at the, the numbers. So I was looking for a breathing space and these are the images I was taking in between the corpses. Field, road and cloud. This is one of the largest pieces. You are invited to enter hallway, which is in the dark, and you're welcomed by a, a very long line of text that measures around 15 feet, uh, five meters. And uh, the font is illuminated from inside, and it's very small, so you have to be very close and read it. And that text tells the story of what happened in Rwanda. And roughly halfway through the text, it tells the story of a woman called Gutete Emerita. I met Gutete outside in a field next to a massacre site, and she told me about her husband and two sons that had been killed in front of her own eyes with machetes. And so she was hiding, and she was coming out only at night in search of food. So we took her to the hospital, but I was able to, to learn her story. So that's what I tell here. And in the end of the line, I said, I remember her eyes, the eyes of Kutete Emerita. That's when we reach the end and we enter the second room. And we are confronted with a very large light table, which measures around six meters by eight meters, on top of which we find a million slides. And there are loops, magnifiers, around the table inviting us to, to see these images. And this is the moment I'm waiting for, when a member of the audience goes in close and their eyes 
are one centimeter away from the image. And they see Gutete's eyes. And they quickly realize that it's the same image repeated a million times. In this work, I wanted to create a balance between information and spectacle. In order for us not to dismiss this image, we must understand it. So that why is the text at the entrance of the space. And once we understand the story, then it's more difficult to dismiss this image. So it's a way in a memorial for Gutete, his family, and for the people of Rwanda. This is one other uh, public project. This is also in, in Sweden. This is in Stockholm. Stockholm was celebrating the cultural capital of Europe. They offered me a project. I created a piece called The Gift. And we went out in the streets of Stockholm with 35 volunteers and we gave away a red box, simply saying, may I offer you a gift? The operation lasted three days, and uh, when people received the box, they noticed that only on one edge it says, please open here. And uh, when you open it, it asks you, what did you expect? We can only invite you to get out of yourself. Please give something to someone else. And then in the small type, it says, please open this box completely and refold it in reverse, leaving the inside outside and the outside inside. So it becomes this. And we are confronted by four images of three kids looking at something that will remain forever off frame. But their body languages communicate more it communicates love, solidarity, pain, all the things that we fail to communicate as, as a so-called international community. And on the top, we have a, a card with the bank account number of Doctors Without Borders, one of the most important NGOs working in Rwanda at the time. And so when you felt generous, you could send them money through the bank or the box with the hole becomes uh, a money box and a conversation piece, inviting people to put money in and then when there is enough to bring it to the bank. So we raised uh, $200,000 that went to Rwanda. Another public project was in France. Of the three major countries indirectly involved with the genocide were France, the United States and Belgium. The story is too complex to, to tell it now. But Belgium and the United States recognize indirectly their participation or their lack of participation. But France has refused to say anything. In fact, we are afraid that France really armed the Hutu military. So this action took place in France. This is the Hotel de Ville in, in Lyon. And for three days and night, we projected on the facade the names of places where between 5,000 and 100,000 people were killed. Names that are meaningless to most of us. Names like Kigali, Jikongoro, Rukara, Shiangugu, Mibilisi. A million people were, came to see the project during those three days while the mayor was having a VIP party for Christmas. It may seem strange to you here, especially the many of you who lost members of your family, but all over the world there were people like me sitting in offices day after day after day who did not fully appreciate the depth and the speed 
with which you were being engulfed by this unimaginable terror. To go back to Rwanda has been very painful. There are many conferences around the genocide to try to understand what happened. And of course, there are many answers, but this is one of the most important memorials inside Kigali. Emphasis is put on children because the, the Hutu killed 50,000 children. They didn't want them to grow up to become Tutsis. They have amazing displays of clothing, clothing that suggests the soul of those who were alive at the time. And vitrines with bones. Too many bones. If you go around Rwanda, you will find hundreds of memorial places, mass graves, and displays of this kind. The most, perhaps, notorious element of, of these memorials are not the names, which is a, a Western convention. It's the display of the horror kept intact. This is a church under protection. They sanitize the, 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 the clothing, but they display it. And bones, and more bones, and more skulls. When you ask Rwandan about this, they explain they want to show the world that it happened this incredulous world that didn't believe it was happening or didn't want to believe because it didn't want to intervene. That is the reason for this display everywhere. This is a video I did recently on one of my trips back. It lasts uh, three minutes.
But life must go on, and it goes on. And uh, Rwanda has one of the most uh, vibrant economies of Africa today. It may seem strange to you here, especially the many of you who lost members of your family. But all over the world, there were people like me sitting in offices day after day after day who did not fully appreciate the depth and the speed with which you were being engulfed by this unimaginable terror. I think Clinton knew exactly what was going on in Rwanda. As in so many other things, his mind was off somewhere else at the time, and he just didn't take it seriously enough. And all this caterwauling about, if only I had known, spare me. He knew. People know they were wrong. They know that their behavior allowed the worst genocide at the end of the 20th century that is imaginable. And they still to this day cannot acknowledge it and cannot atone for it and cannot have the decency and the courage to present themselves to Rwanda and say we were wrong, we're here to commemorate the horror with you. We will stand shoulder by shoulder by you as you attempt to overcome the inheritance. But the world just cocked out again. That, I guess, is what makes one feel maybe it could happen again. If you're so irresolute ten years after the event, then maybe it could happen again. Maybe that's just a commentary on how delinquent we are. Thank you. No? Okay. Thank you. So, it hurts, and I um, can't find the proper words in English to um, explain what I feel following this uh, lecture. Um, you confronted us with a, a whole range of, of um, images, uh, types of images, so the escapist image, the delayed picture, the uh, breathing break uh, images you made in Rwanda, and the off-frame picture. Uh, so it's, uh, for me, it's also um, iconography. Um, what um, are you doing? So I, I would like to uh, open uh, the discussion, and I'm sure um, there are questions and comments and reactions. I suppose I should have taken another minute to formulate this, but um, I worked with a PhD student who was writing her thesis on the Rwandan genocide memorials. And she distinguished quite strongly between what the government had constructed at Kigali versus the local 
uh, memorials, uh, either constructed by individuals or the survivors. And what took me so long to get around in order to actually be able to help her <laughs> um, or advise her was uh, working against uh, notions of constructing monuments to genocide, mostly modeled, obviously, on the Shoah, and, and Lanzmann's notions of thresholds of representability. And uh, I guess my question is, in terms of the way that you chose to memorialize or pay tribute or remember victims, how you see yourself in dialogue with those more local memories, lo local memorials, which, from what I understand, rely so heavily on witnessing, on someone actually opening up the door to the bones, which originally were just kind of had lie scattered on them. Some of them then ended up being cleaned and categorized. But, oops. Um, I think it just went off. Oh, no, there's. So from the, the boxes that one can't open, which I'd see more within a tradition coming out of uh, memorials and anti-memorials from the Shoah to the slides um, that seem to be more maybe resonating with those local monuments. Anyway, so that was, that's really my question, though, sort of these differences in frameworks of of the degradation of memory, the degradation, because there wasn't the concern to really preserve, you know, to shellac the railroad car or to make sure that the museum was built out of, you know, reinforced steel and concrete, so. Thank you. Uh, of course, uh, the, um, the visit and uh, of these memorials around Rwanda and the conversation with the survivors has been an important aspect of my, my work and has informed my work. Everything is really coming out of there because it is a result of research in situ. And so that's why I, I, I present these works as exercises, as, as failing exercise. But if there is one important constant of these, in these works is that I'm an outsider and I will remain an outsider. I'm not speaking for anyone but myself. I'm not a Rwandan. I just want to inform my audience, I want to share my outreach, and I want to give as, as much information I can in the most poignant but poetic way about what happened and why it happened. So I would say that in some of these exercises, I, I create parallel narratives to what's happening on the ground, and perhaps in other exercises, I go beyond or, or further uh, what is happening on the ground, based on, of course, on who I am. I'm an artist from Chile who lives in New York. So, um, but I would say this, that really there is nothing more important that, that remain an outsider and, and really present myself as an outsider. Thank you very much for this very deeply moving lecture. Um, it's very hard to formulate a question, so I'd rather start with your beginning and wonder what your research into um, Clinton's sneeze actually resulted in, whether you did find out that she snows, sneezed, whatever, <laughs> rather than just concealing her face. But then I would like to know more about what the neighboring countries of Rwanda's reactions were what they you know, do to commemorize, whether they come to visit the memorial sites, or who are the people who actually go there? It's, it's incredibly complex and layered, and uh, that would be another lecture, really. Uh, you should know that the, the Tutsis were refugees in Uganda. And so when they came back to, to get their country back, they came back from Uganda. And they came back speaking English. So some observers believe that the French were supporting the Rwanda military because of the French, which is the official language at the time in Rwanda. And so there is this very special relationship between Uganda and Rwanda. On the other hand, Congo and Burundi are different stories. Burundi was a place where many refugees sought refuge. And when the conflict ended, they just went back. 
But Congo, former Zaire, is a more complex story because of the refugee camps that, uh, as you know, they were accused of harboring some of the killers. And so the NGOs had a very difficult work in order to, to uh, identify who are killers and who are real refugees. And, uh, and the political situation in Kinshasa, in, 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 in Zaire, was also in, in Republic of Congo, was also quite complex at the same time. So there were two conflicts at the same time going on, the Rwandan conflict and the Congo conflict. So again, it's a, it's a very complex situation, but uh, in a nutshell, these are the three uh, countries and this is what's happening there at the time. Thank you, um, and thank you very much for a very powerful intervention. I just want to go back to um, your piece on surveying the media and looking for Africa in life and all those different issues. Um, and of course, there's many examples of conflicts around the world that have been ignored um, by the media. And there's been Noam Chomsky that's been criticizing what he calls the media establishment for ignoring the conflict in East Timor um, and the Congo nowadays and so on and so forth. And I guess my, my question for you is, do you see yourself as an artist? Um, that, that is your job to um, bring these conflicts into light, in a, in a cri critical light, but also do you think that it should be our job in the West to be watchdog over these conflicts? The answer for me has always been very simple. Uh, as an artist, I want to act in the world. And in order to act in the world, I must understand it. There is no way to act in the world as a studio artist, as doing little things in your studio and throwing out in the world. I think, for me, that's quite irresponsible. So in order for me to act in the world, I have to understand. And in order to understand, I have to investigate. So all my works have always been responses to things happening around me in my immediate surroundings and beyond. And so East Timor and, 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 and one of the 38 country, uh, conflicts going on right now in the world are of interest to me, like other things, like homelessness in the city I live, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just a matter of, 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 of thinking like that as an artist. I feel extremely privileged to being an artist because I'm given the time and the resources to think, to speculate, to ask questions and to even propose answers. But I feel that this privilege comes with the responsibility of informing myself in order to act. And in order to do that, I have to understand. And so that is why this, this huge uh, research and investigative process behind every one of my works, which, are, which last between two and six years because of that aspect. During your presentation, uh, I had the feeling that I, for the first time in this uh, symposium, heard uh, two words, or felt two words, uh, which are in a close context with uh, searching for the truth in images. The one word is risk, and the other is courage. Uh, Michel Foucault worked a lot on this, uh, about uh, saying the truth, and also the, also the uh, Greek word parousia uh, means this, uh, speaking uh, in the public and taking a risk to speak out for personal uh, risk, uh, uh, speaking out your opinion and taking a risk. Um, my question to you is, as an artist, do you think that we or that you still need to take risks and uh, to be courageous uh, to find out the truth. And the second is, um, it's a statement or it's a conclusion for me, uh, the 
image in the Situation Room uh, is the same of the same quality as the statement of Clinton uh, when he talked uh, in Rwanda. That is, neither Clinton nor the Bush team took any courage and any risk uh, to do via the images uh, what they did. They just kept it open, like in a postmodern uh, context, uh, to make it uh, contingently, that is, uh, beliebig in German. You can do an interpretation into these statements and images, whatever you want, because the two elements are missing, taking a risk and being courageous. So, also in the relation to uh, the presentation we had uh, prior to this, uh, with the Arabian Revolution, when the multitude is taking a lot of pictures, where, are, where is the risk and where is the courage? And does this uh, assemble the truth? Uh, I'm not sure I, I, I understand the question, but uh, it sounds like it's a very generous comment. Thank you, if that is. And uh, perhaps my in impulse is to say to you that whatever courage or risk I may take in my work, which are minimal, have nothing to compare to the risk and courage of the people that I've reported on. Thank you, Alfredo, again. And Thank you.